So we get a call that that uh, there's multiple units in contact in the same region. Again, I've got a targeting pod pulled up on one of my displays, and I'm following along with what's happening. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear round two of our two-part combat story from seasoned F-15E Strike Eagle fighter pilot Tom Gunny Moser. Moser would go on to be a weapons fighter school graduate, the Air Force's top gun, in addition to a squadron and wing weapons officer. In this episode, we dig into several combat experiences from the F-15's front seat of what makes this aircraft so lethal. This includes the very first strikes into Syria in 2014, taking it on ISIS, where Gunny helped plan these missions and lead some of the first attacks into theater. If you didn't hear round one with Gunny, at this point, he's finally made it to his first Air Force squadron after several years as a Marine infantryman, hence the call sign Gunny, and a stint as a police officer, which was something he loved doing. He's got an incredibly supportive spouse who told him not to come home if he didn't get F-15s because there's only winners in this house. Gunny is good friends with both former guest Ryan Stinger Fischel and our future guest, Mike Paco Benitez an F-15E Strike Eagle weapons systems officer. Stay tuned for our interviews with Paco to hear both Gunny and Paco interview together about their time downrange as a front seater and back seater combo as the standard bearer weapon officers in their units. With that, please enjoy this discussion digging into danger close weapons engagement from an expert, Tom Gunny Moser. I guess first, is there anything else that happens on that op? Anything else kinetic? No. Or so no weapons effects were good. It's a great they stopped taking probably fire. A great first and, yeah success. First trigger pull. And, and 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 I would say not a very complex yeah op. I mean it was at the time just because it was the first one and didn't really fully know what to expect. I mean you know, we train train like you fight, so it was a lot like training. But until you're in actual real combat, it's it's you can never induce the stresses of combat without being in combat. I still remember the first um, unit when we were in Afghanistan that actually had a tick that they responded to and they came back and was super successful. And we were all like, oh, those bastards, they got it first. I'm sure coming back on like a, a right seat, left seat ride, like, yeah, yeah, we just had effects. What happens after that mission when you come back? If you put, if you put a, a missile on a target, is there a debrief that you have to do? We're going to debrief sign every off? mission. Now, if if you're just doing what we'd call X-CAST, which is a lot of times they would, rather than have guys alert on the ground, they would have airborne alert, essentially. So you're orbiting over a position waiting for someone to need you. You're kind of like on call, ready mm-hmm. to go airborne. Um, and if nothing happens, there's not really a long debrief. But if there, if something does happen, then especially if you employ weapons, you're going to come back, you're going to debrief it. You know, what did we do? How did we do it? Could we have done it better? Could we have done it more efficient? How was the time from the time we got eyes on the target until we actually employed weapons? Was that appropriate for the situation? You know, were there any questions? We we look at everything as much as we can because we always want to improve. We always want to be better. We always want to be more efficient. And because when you are in the aircraft, you are relatively out of harm's way. Most of the time. I mean, there's times you're strafing with the gun all the way down to three or 500 feet and you're somewhat in harm's way, but you're still protected by a titanium suit of armor in a sense, right? It's not like the guys on the ground that may have just seen one of their friends be wounded or killed and you know their adrenaline level is going to be different. So we actually, we talk about that and we train to be, be that calming effect. We're the blanket of protection above to, to be that calming voice on the radio. Right. Even though you're you're amped up because you hear gunfire, you can tell their voice that things are getting serious. You've got to be that calming effect to reassure them that we are here for you and we are going to help you and we're all going to get out of this together. Right. And so the when we go back then and debrief it, we we talk to all that. And then you have to write an after action report. You know, just kind of details the who, what, where, when, why, what happened, and what the results are. You then we, we call cut the tapes. So at the time we were using actual like eight millimeter tape cassettes. Now it's all digital, but you, you chop it, you cut it, and now you save it because a lot of times the weapons officer will come back and he'll review all the engagements and employments just to see, are there gaps in tactical knowledge? Mm-hmm. Are there gaps in the squadron that are trends in rules of engagement knowledge or 
you know, is there somewhere lead instructor of the squadron, lead tactics and weapons officer, is there something that they need to shape or steer the squadron in a different direction? Or, I mean, you know, if something bad were to happen or there was a question yeah. about a civ cast or whatnot, then that comes up as well. It's one of the few parts of the military where all of your actions are recorded effectively. You know, like you can't, there's no second guessing it. Like somebody can go and watch what you did. And it, I mean, it changes how you operate. I would say to some degree, when you know somebody else is going to see this, when I, as soon as I land, somebody of the squadron is going to see yep. what we did. Um, I think from when we were prepping, 07 is a pretty adventurous uh, rotation for you. It is, and partly because the situation in the ROE. And I noticed those differences in 07 and 09 and 2014. In 07, there weren't a lot of restrictions. If the ground force felt that there was either imminent risk or immediate risk, then you could employ weapons to include on buildings and things of that nature. As we go back in 09, the ROE had changed. Like you couldn't drop on a building unless you had reasonable certainty that there was no innocent civilians in it. And I, whether that's wrong or right, it doesn't matter, but that was the ROE. So, so it was less restrictive in 07, which is why I think that there was uh, there was a fair amount of weapons being yeah. deployed. One of the stories that that you kind of prepared us for was multiple ticks and having to to kind of choose. Can you take us through that up? And we're you know how far along are you in the deployment at the time? So we were we were probably about halfway through. So a couple months in. So you're feeling comfortable, but you don't want to get complacent because every situation can be different. And I was flying with a very experienced flight lead instructor. And I had the weapons officer in my back seat. There was a WIZO weapons officer flying with me. Is that more stressful? It depends on the weapons officer, but no. I mean, if you're doing the right thing, you're not being, of course, he's always evaluating, but you know, but you're not officially <laughs> being true. evaluated, yeah. but, but I didn't feel it. Okay. The, I, I, I tried to do the right thing and, and they like, they like it or they don't, you know, they could tell me if they don't. So. But so we get a call that that uh, there's multiple units in contact in the same region. And so we go there and the flight leads like, hey, go get gas. I'm going to go there now. Right. Because at least then there's an aircraft versus both of us going to get gas. So we go get gas. and He goes to the, to the fight. And I think he employed. I, I don't remember for sure, but I think he did with everything that was going on. And so we get there and he, he's already leaving the area. Like he's a, he's bingo fuel. He's on his way out, but now we're, we're topped off. We're coming in and he's like, you know, here's the basic situation. You've got the AO. Okay. We got the AO. So we come in and very quickly I started to feel overwhelmed and I'm not even talking to the JTACs on the ground. I'm talking to the command and control to make sure we've got the airspace and if there's anybody else around, what's the stack, what are the resources available? but it's pretty much just us. And the weapons officer in the back, he's talking, he's talking to multiple guys that are screaming for help. And very quickly, he did a great job. And this was a, a learning lesson for me to, of how to handle this kind of thing. Like, it's almost like triage. Like, okay, man, like, I understand you're saying you need help, but like your buddy over here is really screaming for help. And he's like, no, no, I'm good. Go help him. Right. And so we finally, we kind of sorted out of, Who's in the most dire need of help? And so we sorted it out. We got to the right JTAC and we start talking to them. Can, can I um, apologize to people listening for interrupting? Just from the rotary wing guy, to have multiple ticks is rare. Like, what is the 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 spatial distance between these ticks on the ground? Are they? They're probably miles. A, yeah, a few miles. Okay. But I mean, when we're airborne, I can see that's what five, I mean. Yeah, ten it's miles different perspective easily, you know? from where you guys are flying. It's just it's more the limitation of sensors and and the ability to, to have attention to what's going on. So, what was it that was overloading you coming in? You said you were kind of alone in the airspace. Wizzo's got several folks, and he's trying to triage. What was it that was starting to overtax you? You want to help the guys on the ground, yeah. and it's trying to figure out. Who needs to help the worst? Because you want to help everybody. How can I do this? How can I help all of them? And maybe you can't. Because the worst thing you can do is rush and make a mistake. So that's where you've got to be disciplined. And 
as I'm feeling that anxiety and getting amped up, I can't do that. I need to be that calming effect, right? We need to be calm, cool, and collected and be that reassurance of confidence to say, you know, we're here and we're going to get it done for you. So, so you identify the one tick you're going to go support. We do. Okay. And so again, I've got a targeting pod pulled up on one of my displays and I'm following along with what's happening. And it was just the first time I had seen in the targeting pod, I can see the gunfire. I can see good friendlies and enemy in the same screen. They're close. I mean, they're real close to where they're throwing grenades. Like I can see grenades being thrown. So they're close. And now I'm thinking how, okay, what's the best way to help them? What's the best weapon? Because what I don't want to do is have my weapon be more of a risk to the friendlies than the enemy are. So, so the, the weapons officer is talking to him and he says, I want a 500 pound laser guided bomb. Here's where I want it. And I'm looking at that going, that's close. And so we have numbers for collateral damage as well as risk estimate, risk estimate distances to the friendlies. And if it's inside of a certain distance, the ground commander has to sign off on it because now he's saying, I understand there's a risk to my guys from the weapon. I'm willing to accept that because the situation warrants it. So that conversation happens. He gives his initials. That tells us that he is authorizing the release and the JTAC is ordering it on his behalf. And I was hesitant. It was the first time that I had to take a pause and, and, and go, is this really the right thing? And so normally the pilot doesn't talk to the JTAC a whole lot unless the Wizzo's busy. But I remember good key in the mic and saying, Hey man, like you're really close. Are you sure? And he says, I understand your concern. We need this to happen. You're cleared hot. And so the, the trust he put in us and the confidence he put in, in to us to employ that weapon and keep them safe. I wasn't going to let him down. So we were methodical and disciplined, make sure we have the right run in axis. So if the bomb falls long or short, it doesn't put them in more jeopardy. And we dropped the weapon. Uh, it had the desired effects. They were able to, I think at that point, they were looking to withdraw and regroup with one of the other forces and support one of the other troops in contact. And they were able to do so. So uh, it was an effective drop. The friendlies, they're smart. I mean, the ground guys, the the ground forces, I won't say they don't need us. We're a support asset, but they're not impotent. I mean, these are lethal trained killers. So they're going to follow their tactics and they're going to keep themselves alive and take it to the enemy as best they can. We're going to help them do it. We're going to maximize their advantage because there's no such thing as a fair fight. But uh, it, it worked out and they were able to regroup without taking any casualties. Do you remember what kind of a, a round you put down range on that one? That was a 500 pound laser guided bomb. <laughs> What? Danger close. Yeah. Like 50 meters. Is there something you do with the fuse on that one to give yourself a little bit more leeway? You don't have a lot of options because the there's it's not cockpit selectable per se, but uh, you try, I mean, again, the 40 degree angle. So a lot of the blast is going to go forward, which is why running axis mm-hmm. is important. And they were, they were hunkering down behind some pretty thick walls as well, but I didn't just want to rely on that. But th- they needed it, and they said they were prepared, and I, and I trusted them, and they trusted us. Obviously, I'm very familiar with the laser-guided Hellfire. I don't know what the GPS-guided is like. I mean, is the GPS-guided munition a lot more accurate than you're going to get from a laser? It's, it's a little bit more accurate, but it's not really the accuracy. It's the flexibility. You can drop it further away. Because a laser-guided bomb, you generally drop around a ballistic release point. So that even if you never turn on the laser, it'll hit close to the target. But you're just trying to get it in a window to be able to hit it. A GPS-guided bomb, it can actually fly to the target in a sense. So you've got a lot more leeway of when you drop it to where if you miss the release point on a laser-guided, you're going to have to come back and spin around. And, you know, I've said this in brief in some of the industry people because I got to go where they build the fuses for the weapons. And I told them, I said, look, if this fuse doesn't work and this bomb doesn't go off, it could be five minutes before we get another bomb on target. That's a long time to be getting shot at. I mean, that's a lifetime. So it, it counts to get it right the first time. Whereas the GPS bomb gives you more latitude 
and it gives you more flexibility. I can bring it a higher impact angle. I can change the fuse settings. We can we can do a lot of different things to to depending on the tactical situation. Assume the Wizzo is lazing that target while you're pulling the trigger. Yes. Yep, they're going to laze the target. We generally you can delay laser, you continuous laze. So it, it depends on the situation. But yeah, they're going to be controlling the pod and the laser. We're going to drop the weapon uh, once they concur that they're ready to go, and we can release it, drop it. And then we're going to fly the airplane to make sure the laser's in an optimal position as they continue to laze it into impact. And I got to imagine on that one, you're both like watching the. Oh the yeah, feed you're watching the count incredibly you're watching closely, the feed, making sure that it hits where it's supposed to. And because bombs fail, fins fail, fuses fail. You know, sometimes you don't know where the bomb hit, and you don't know why. Um, what happens after that round? So you, you you mentioned ground force is able to kind of regroup and go and support someone else. Were you done for that night or was that just the beginning? That was the beginning, but things started to, to wind down after that. A lot of times when air shows up, the enemy changes what they're doing because they know really that, so. that they're probably in for a rough night at that point. So they were able to withdraw, regroup with another unit. By that point, that unit's tick had wound, wound down. Um, I think we did a couple shows of force where we go down, we, we go a few miles away, we drop down to 500 feet above the ground. And then we accelerate to four or 450 knots and you fly over the, the enemy forces. Because if you've ever been in an air show with the blue angels or the Thunderbirds, and when that jet comes screaming over out of the, from the side or behind you and you feel it in your chest and you, it almost deafens you, that's the effect you have on the enemy. And then it's, it's a psychological effect. It's a physical effect. And it's essentially to say, we're here. This is the first step. This is your last chance, right? Like this is your warning because mm -hmm. the next step is, is probably going to end poorly for you. Was that drop at night? No, that was no, all during the day. day. I assume it's easier when you're doing the day shot, but at least for us in the Apache, we're still using FLIR most of the time, making a call, whether it's day or night. You are. We, you had, you've got an IR. You've also got a TV mode. It really just depends mm -hmm. on what the best is for the environmentals and, and the circumstances. And the whistle will flip back and forth to see what the best picture is for them. But the, the challenging part with nights is now the ground becomes a significant risk to you as well. So if you're, especially in the, in a, the mountains of Afghanistan, I mean, not that it doesn't during the day, but if you've got to dip below the minimum safe altitude, you've got to make sure you can do it safely. So you've either got to be on night vision goggles if it's a high enough illumination, or you've got to be, we had a train following system in the airplane that could take you down. And if you were within its protections, you could go down to 500 feet and try it and you yeah, and can't see anything so can you speak to as long as we're not getting into anything too sensitive but we had some terrain following we're moving way slower than y'all were in an apache um but it also wasn't great to really like put your trust in something and drop down at night with low loom 500 feet going 400 knots or, or faster like what what is how is that displaying to you as a pilot what's giving you the reassurance with that well, there's a lot of redundancy built into the system. And if it fails, it's going to tell you and it's actually going to climb the airplane in, in what we call a fly-up maneuver. Now, the system's getting old and it's a lot of money to sustain, but it's a very niche capability that thus far the combatant commands have said they still want to maintain. But at the time, if, if the system's working we, and you stay within the bounds of the system, we trusted it. You could go down to 100 feet. But you were very limited on your maneuverability because if you, the more you bank the aircraft, you're masking the radar that it's using to terrain follow. But it would fly the up down, the vertical based on the terrain, and then you would fly the the lateral. Where is it presenting to you? So you've got some symbology in your HUD, but then you've got a scope on the side that's telling you, and you can see if there are spikes in the terrain coming up um, and whatnot. Jeez. Um, normally you would also try to plan it if you could ahead of time, if you knew where you were going, or we even had moving map display to show you, Hey, there's terrain in this area. So you had, you know, a one to 50, a one to two fifty, and you had a lot of that symbology and the map to look at real time in the airplane. And sometimes, I mean, we went to a couple places where you're next to these massive 10,000 foot mountains and then just a steep Valley. And you might, there was a couple of times we had to say, I, like, I can't strafe in there. I can't get in there safely. It's too much risk to the airplane than it is the benefit of the weapons yeah. I can employ. 
at that point I would go to a weapon I could drop from altitude and I would try to offset it or, or delay fuse it to try to mitigate if I needed to. Do you remember the first time you provided cover for Marines on the ground? I do. So we were working with the Marines and so the first deployment we went on, we, we didn't have the newer radios because now we've got radios that have SATCOM, they've got VHF, UHF, FM, Maritime, you know, they've kind of got the whole gamut. And at the time, we didn't have the capability to talk on FM. So if there was not a dedicated JTAC with the ground forces, then you might be talking to their tactical operations center. Wow. And so that's rough, but you're still trying to support. And so we were tasked because we weren't tasked with anything else. So the talks says, Hey, well, let's have them co cover these guys. And we were following this Marine convoy and they got into a village and all of a sudden we see explosions in the targeting pod. I'm like, we well, got no comms nope. right now. Like, holy shit, they just got attacked. So we're telling their talk, like, hey, they just took fire. And we see them returning fire. We see them maneuvering. And again, it's like, okay, how do we help them? Right? We can't talk to them. How do we help them? So I'm still a wingman. So the flight lead, great call. He says, you maintain cover. I'm going in for a show of force. Because there's no ROE requirement for a show of force. You're not employing weapons. And so... Mm -hmm. So we are maintaining cover. We're monitoring the tactical situation, trying to figure out what's going on. And he drops down and does a show of force over top of them. At that point, though, once they're dismounted, without calm, it's hard to tell who's who. So I wouldn't really have been comfortable just rolling in with weapons anyway because you're just as likely to hit a friendly as you are an enemy. And, and again, let's be honest. The Marines are not impotent. I mean, locate, close with, and destroy the enemy. That's their bread and butter. <laughs> So, you know, I lived it, I learned <laughs> Love it, it and you know, that's what they do. So, but you also don't want to be a cheerleader, you know, like you want to, you want to do something to, to maximize their advantage. So the show of force helped. The enemy was like, uh, okay, maybe we need to rethink our decisions. They pulled back, but then they were getting chatter. Talk was telling us that, yeah, they're, it sounds like they, they broke contact because the enemy is regrouping to attack them on the other side of the village. Cause they, they took a corner. That's where they hit the choke point that's where they got the ambush and then the, went through the center of town and then it kind of turned another 90 left and we thought that that's probably where they were going to set up the ambush again and so trying to lead turn it without being able to communicate with them we started just doing rotating shows of force over that area as they got back in their vehicles and started to continue through the village just to try to be proactive just to create some effects some noise let the enemy know that that we were there and if we could identify them that we were going to employ weapons on them and it seemed to have a positive effect uh, they took a little fire on the way out but at that point it wasn't worth them dismounting and you know putting themselves at a disadvantage so uh, they started to egress the area and and we got chatter again that that it was having the effect that we wanted it to have so so weapons effects essentially accomplished so that uh, to get them out of there do you, does it feel different when you're rolling in to support some Marines, given your background in the Marine Corps? Is it yes and no. a little bit more uh, like, yeah. I know these guys. I mean, in a way, yes, but we all bleed, yeah. we all bleed green. You yeah. Know? Oh man. I can't even imagine. Like if you had identified some enemy there, would you have been able to take a shot? So we actually did. We identified some people fleeing on motorcycles from the scene once the friendlies were safely out, and we tracked them for several miles. But at that point, the ROE wouldn't allow for release authority because there was no imminent threat. So even though we, we had positive ID, they would not let us employ based on the fact that there was no longer imminent threat. Were you doing any man to unman teaming at that time? It was like early days of. Yeah. With UAVs. I mean, so I don't think we were doing a lot with the UAVs on that deployment. I mean, you might be in a stack with them providing with task force or whatever, providing awareness, but not a lot of, not a lot of direct coordination and not, it wasn't that deployment. Like the following deployment, we, there was a couple of times where we're actually lazing for hellfires from a UAV or yeah. whatnot, but wow. that deployment, no, not really. So th that four and a half months, what was it like coming back from that? Kind of what you expected? Yes and no. So again, my wife and I are very pragmatic and she had gone back to Ohio to spend with family because I mean, I'm not there. So she took my son who was three at the time and they went back to Ohio. 
And she's like, Hey, do you want us to come down for when you guys get there? I'm like, why? Cause we're just going to go back to Ohio a day or two later. So why make the trip? And so she's like, okay. So we're getting off, you know, first off we come into land and, and I had planned to leave the next day to go to Ohio to go see my family. Well, then we find out on the bird coming home, they go, well, you know, the, you have to get these briefs when you get home, the reintegration briefs to make sure that you're mentally prepared to come back to society and you're not going to hurt your wife and your family in this. And this is like a Saturday. And they go, but they're not going to be in until Monday. And I'm like, okay, so Sunday, apparently we're all good to go. But so they can't brief us over the weekend because they don't work during the weekend. <laughs> so you got to wait till Monday to get these briefs. So the earliest I can go home now is Tuesday. And I'll be honest, that pissed me off. A little yeah. Bit. I'm like, really? Because I'm going I'm to be less of a threat by Tuesday than I am on Sunday. Like, what are we talking about here? So, and it, I'm not a super emotional, touchy feely kind of guy, but it was a little disappointing when you get off the plane and everybody's running up to their families. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm here by myself. I guess I'll just go home. And, and, and the funny thing I remember from that night was when we went to Bagram, even though it was the winter, we had, you know, most time, I think we ran the air conditioning and, there was constant background noise in the bee huts in your living quarters. And I remember going home and my wife's gone, my son's gone, the dog's gone. And I'm laying in bed that night and it's just dead quiet. And I'm like, I can't, I can't go to sleep. Like, it's just dead quiet. Cause you get used to that background noise and whatnot. And so, uh, so the interesting thing though, a couple of days later, we get the briefs. I'm flying home. My wife is hanging out at the airport with her mother and my parents and my son and and apparently there was a news crew just trolling for stories there. And they're like, um, excuse me, you know, what are you doing here? And they're like, oh, we're waiting for my husband. He's coming home. He just got back from Afghanistan. And they're like, story. So as I get off the plane and come walking down, I get camera shoved in my face. And, <laughs> and you know, and they're like, hey, how does it feel to be back with your family and, and whatnot? So they made up for it yeah. for, now, the, for the homecoming. Now, I'll also say. It's a different world nowadays from when I was in the Marine Corps from a communications perspective. You know, there was morale phones that you could call home. And I, I worked in the scheduling shop. I had a phone at my desk. Yeah. And I worked nights, which is when my wife would have been awake. So I probably talked to my wife two, three times a week, which it was very fortunate. And I was lucky in that sense because a lot of troops at forward operating bases and other locations, they don't have that luxury. No. So I wasn't going to deprive myself of it purposely, but I recognize that that was a luxury that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. So, so coming back, I mean, it, it wasn't like you were writing letters for, right. It wasn't like right? I hadn't like spoken to my wife in, in months and months. And, and, you know, to us, I've been gone for four months. What's a, another couple of days is not going to swing the needle one way or another. So of course we wanted to see each other, but you know, not at a significant inconvenience to her. How on that first deployment does your son impact you're flying at all, if at all. He's I mean, three, you said at the time. Yeah, right? he's, so he's three. young. He's like, young. I mean, I took steps to make sure that he was taken care of in the sense that I went and I, and I can't remember what it was, but there was like a teddy bear you could get. And I recorded me singing a song to him. Yeah. And then it goes this. inside. Right. So mm -hmm. now he has a teddy bear. There was a, the, the morale people did a pillowcase with my picture on it. And so he's got a pillow there with my picture and, and things like that. And and I always purposely made sure that he was very close to my wife, like very in touch with her, because if I didn't make it home, I wanted to make sure they already had that bond. And it's not that I distanced myself from him because I was very close with him. He's an only child, but, but I always made sure that they, that they were very close together so that he would have her if something yeah. ever happened to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, how long do you have... So you said maybe 16 months before you go down range again. Yeah. Typically. So we got back in around January ish of 08 and we deployed again in the summer of 09. So same yeah, unit. So you got, yeah, same unit. So you get see all these guys still. A couple probably rotate out. Yeah. Anytime you get back from deployment, in. normally it's common because you've missed a assignment cycle. So the squadron's going to get hit and you're going to get liquidated normally. So, but. I was fortunate in that I was now an instructor in the unit and the squadron commander elected to keep me in the unit to go on the deployment. 
so that I actually almost spent four years in my first ops assignment where normally you would only spend three. Jeez. But he can't have all his instructors and experience leave right before deployment. So he's got some latitude to retain some people so that he can take them and deploy with them. And where do you go this next time? Same place. We went back to Bagram, but uh, just a little bit different environment. You know, it How just, so? Yeah. More built up. Bagram itself. Bagram's a little more built up. And which you get more people, you get more bureaucracy, you get more oversight. Uh, rules of engagement had changed. Stricter. I think they were more strict, rightfully so, because, I mean, imagine if somebody came into our, our town and, and started bombing stuff and inadvertently killed my friends. I, regardless of whether I was an enemy of them before, I certainly would be now. So I think initially, and, and this is where I start to have thoughts of like, what are we doing? Right now, I was a Marine. I was a fighter pilot. I'm going to, I'm going to go do the job. I was, I was signed up to do that. Mm -hmm. I swore I would do. And you're really doing it for the guys and gals on the ground. You're doing it for the people next to you, whether you're on the ground or in the air, you are there for the man and the woman next to you is, is really what it boils down to the politics. They don't exist at that point. But over time, as you start to go, okay, what are we doing? Are we just moving around symbols on a map? Like what's the long-term strategic goal and what's the value? Because there's, we're paying for this in lives and we're affecting people in a profound way. So what are we doing? That just starts to kind of creep into my mind and right or wrong. I don't know if you know the Marines and the army are not a peacekeeping force. It's not what they were designed to do. And I think we we put forces into an area and asked them to do a mission that they weren't trained or equipped to do. And it had some ill effects in the beginning. So we had to evolve over time and training was different. The, the different types of uh, people we brought into the theater to do different missions changed over time. And, and so the ROE was different, but it was, it was still busy. I mean, we were still, I mean, I would say even busier than my first deployment. This was, it was Restrepo, right? The yeah. So, can you talk through that one just because really like no that was 07 was it 07 i think so ah maybe could i ask you to just hit that one again yeah so please? when i was watching the movie restrepo there was a situation unfolding and i remember the captain was talking about dropping weapons on a building where the enemy fighters were taking shooting from and then retreating to and as it was happening on the movie i started thinking like this sounds really familiar and I had kept a log of all the missions on my first deployment. And I went back and started looking through them. And I found the one that kind of matched what they were doing on the movie. And then I looked up the dates of when Restrepo, you know, they were in the Korangal Valley and the different operations they had going on. And they matched up. And I'm like, holy shit, this was actually, I think this was our mission. We were the ones dropping these weapons. So it was, it was a really weird sense of being able to see what they were going through on the ground at the same time we had a, a much different perspective in the air and to kind of see their thought process and and how things were evolving it, it was really interesting one of the things I, i've mentioned as i've been interviewed and I, I would imagine it's even more pronounced for a fighter pilot in your experience where as a rotary wing guy you know we'd support these people on the ground and we didn't have the speed or range that you did and we still would never see these people ever again. Like we're, we're overhead, we're dropping bombs, probably the worst day of their life, you know, like if they're bringing us in as an asset and, and then we're gone an hour later, two hours later, and we're never going to go and like see them at the chow hall or at the talk, like we're in a different base. So you, it's almost like this faceless person that you're supporting, but I got to imagine for you, it's even more pronounced. You're flying all over. It is this country. It is. I mean, you you start to recognize some of the call signs and some of the voices, right. but yeah. rarely, like you said, do you ever actually meet up? It was really cool because the way it worked for us was normally the squadrons, we had two op squadrons at the base and they would deploy back to back. So the first squadron would take a mix of jets over and then in the middle, you would swap out via Freedom Bird and then the second squadron would bring the jets home. Well, the, when we went home, we went through Manas in Kyrgyzstan. And it's just a huge, huge building with yeah, I went bunk beds, too. right? Yeah. And we spent, I think, like a week there that we were just hanging out, waiting for a jet to take us home. And we start talking to some of the army guys, and we 
we, you start connecting, you're like, Hey, Oh wait, you're the dudes. You guys were supporting us here. And they start pulling up videos of attacks. Like handy show, cam. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. They're like, Oh yeah, that was you guys and this. And, and That's that was cool. really cool to That's be really able cool. to talk to those guys and play cards with them and, and just share in those experiences and meet face to face. And then, you know, sometimes things come out of the blue that you would never expect. I got, I got a framed, like, thank you letter from a unit that came in out of the blue months later. Right. And I get this and they're like, Hey, this was your flight. And it's like, you know, you guys saved our lives. The, you know, thank you so much yeah. for everything you did. The, and, and I mean, that's one of my most prized possessions. Take it over any metal. Yeah. The metals, the decorations, yeah. that's great for posterity, but, but to have that meant so much to me. That's super cool. So you mentioned the dudes. Can you talk about that? Like, I know exactly what you're talking about because we worked with those call signs all the time. So I, I'm not even sure how it originated, but essentially our call sign was dude. And, you know, like the dude abides, right? And so. <laughs> the big Lebowski. Yeah. And, and just for people tracking, like your call sign is Gunny, but when you're flying over there, the guy on the ground is calling you dude. It is. Yeah. Each platform or each squadron had a call sign. Or we were dude, whether it was one, 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 three, one, five, two, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And so the dudes were the strike eagles out of Bagram for years. And so, yeah, the dude call sign, you knew you were working with a strike eagle. And part of it is it's a pride, right? It's a building of credibility yeah. as a community because what you don't want is to check in and be like, oh, no, don't send the dudes or don't, you know, because a yeah. lot of times they would start requesting you, which is a point of pride because they know it's trust. Mm -hmm. It's they trust you to do the right thing for them. That's super cool that you got that FaceTime. I'm sure waiting in Manas is not fun. Like you're ready to get home. And it's get out not, of there. but. But yeah. if you got to do it, that's the way to do it with the, with the ground guys. Um, okay. 2009. What, what's that to take us through maybe one of the pivotal moments there for you or tougher missions? 2009 was, it was just different because of the ROE. And I remember we were working with, we were working with some soft, so they weren't regular army, but they weren't like, they weren't task force, daytime ops, working with some soft and that we, my wingman had only been there a couple of weeks. He showed up a little bit later because I think he was doing an attached job at the wing and he didn't come in right with the squadron. And so we do the talk on, but now I'm, now I'm an instructor. I'm in the lead jet. That's one of the big differences. So now I'm responsible for the overall conduct of the flight. Have you been to the weapons school yet? I have not. Okay. So I'm a captain. I'm a flight lead. I'm an air to ground instructor. I couldn't get all my air to air stuff done before we deployed because they weren't going to dedicate the resources because we needed to train for air to ground. And so we're, we're at this mission. My Wizzo and I are, are happy with everything that's going on. I give the, the, the brief. I'm like, Hey man, it's going to be shooter shooter. This is what we're going to do. And my wingman says, I, I'm not sure we should drop. Like, I'm not comfortable with this. And that's a big deal. I mean, yeah. Good courage on his part to say, to speak up because in almost any friendly fire or civ cast, when they go back through the after action report, somebody had the hair on their neck standing up or somebody had kind of a tingle in the back of their mind, like, ah, I'm not sure about this, but they didn't speak up. So I was like, okay, well, time out, right? Like if, if there's a question and there's a doubt, there is no doubt. We're going to sort it before we move on. And so it wasn't, a, it wasn't so critical that we didn't have time to do that. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, okay, what's your concern? And he's like, I'm not sure we meet ROE. And I'm like, okay, wh like why? And we have this conversation. Well, there was a couple different sections of ROE that depended who you were working with. And so like task force, you, you had a tick declared when you were going out the door. So a lot of times ROE wasn't as big a deal versus regular army or whatnot. So I'm like, okay, what's your concern? I'm like, well, did you read this section? He's like, oh, I'm not familiar with that. So it was an interesting situation because now I've got to decide, do like my Wizzo and I are comfortable. I've heard his, I've heard his, his, uh, concern. concern. Yeah. I don't think he's interpreting the ROE correctly. And so now, but I'm not going to force him to do something he's not comfortable with. So I said, okay, revised plan. I said, I'm comfortable. The Wizzo's comfortable. We are comfortable that everything lines up. The JTAC's on board. Like, I'm going to drop this weapon for them, but I'm not going to ask you to do it if you're not comfortable. So it's going to be shooter, 
you're going to be a cover. We'll sort it out on the ground. Even that though is implying like, I'm still going to go ahead and do this. Even if you disagree, yeah. you know, it's not probably the most comfortable position to be dropping munitions, but well, it's here you got, that's why you've got to know the rules. You've got mm -hmm. to know the ROE and, and ultimately you've got to make a decision and apathy and a lack of a decision is a decision nonetheless. Yeah. So were we hanging it out there? Maybe a little, but I'm going to do what I think is right. And the Wizzo and I were on board. So we said, we're going to go drop this weapon. And if we're wrong, we'll accept the consequences. So we did, we employed, had the desired effects that they needed. They were taking some indirect fire and it stopped whether we killed the enemy or they withdrew effects achieved. And so we came back and it, it turns out that we were correct. And, and it's not a matter of who was right and wrong. Cause I applauded him. I said, thank you for speaking up. Mm -hmm. That's 100% the right thing to do. But you need to know the ROE. Yeah. There's a little bit of right? responsibility there. Right? Like, I don't want you not to speak up if you're concerned, but I won't say you were wrong, but you didn't know, you didn't have the information you should have had and needed to know to effectively support the guys on the ground. So again, it's not a matter of right and wrong, but you know, I'm like, and if you're not comfortable dropping weapons then maybe you're not, maybe you're not supposed to be here. What was, what was your first experience doing a task force op, which can be higher level. It's implied if they're involved, it's higher level stakes. Right. Do you get that feeling when you're in the air supporting them? You do, but it's, you have to be very disciplined because there may be multiple aircraft in the stack. It's almost going to be right. I mean, and they may have you watching a building on the edge of an, of an, of an op area. Right. And that's not sexy. No, everybody wants to know what's going on. <laughs> right. It's, uh, it's such, you've got to resist the temptation. You've been there. You've got to resist the temptation. This is like you've got an attack dog and you you're know, like, go, sit in the, like, go hang out on hey, the side of the fence. Go stare at the wall, right? <laughs> go stare over here at the wall. But you know what? If some, if a sniper climbs on that roof and shoots at them and you missed it, you fail. Yeah. So that's so funny, but you know, know but then the next thing you know, they're like, uh, Nope, go back. Nah, nope, go back. You know, so uh, I mean, sometimes you're a support asset, right? As fighter pilots and fighter air crew, sometimes you're the tip of the spear. Sometimes you're a support asset, and in that situation, you're a support asset. There's there's nothing wrong with yeah. that, right? And so you stare, you stare at a thing. Now, luckily, most of them weren't that bad. You know, normally you're kind of watching what's going on and and being, you know, but you've got to maintain, I say, on the tactical situation because if if they need you, they need you now, and you got to be ready. So uh, it was really, that was really fulfilling, even though most of the times we weren't employing because they do their job so well. But that's where I really started to personally internalize that not to take anything away from the Marines, the regular army, and, and a lot of the things that were going on in country. But I would venture to say that a lot of the higher level impact that was being occurred was through those types of ops yeah by design though of yeah, course largely right. right i mean they're going after the hardest targets they are um yeah th it was always fun when we get one of those missions you know like stack is enormous we'll call you if we need you always so, at night so you were saying oh was that in the day was that at night so m we were flying 24 hours and normally you would be on the day train for a month or two and then you might go to the night train and if you were on the night train, then it was a high likelihood you were supporting one of those ops. And, uh, but so 09 was a significant deployment because again, now I'm an instructor, I'm, I've been here before. My Wizzo that I get paired with, because generally you get crewed together for at least the beginning of the deployment because now you know each other, you can help each other and it's by experience. Normally a more experienced pilot will have a less experienced Wizzo and vice versa. So my Wizzo was just out of mission call, brand new. So we go to nights. I end up sitting alert different days than him, and I end up launching quite a bit on alert. They also try to be equitable in sortie count. You don't want one person flying 20 times a month and one person flying five. So they're like, hey, we're going to send you back to days. You, you're flying too much. So they split us, and they send me to days, and my Wizzo stays on nights. W wouldn't the Wizzo be with you every time you launch? No. I, I'm not sure why scheduling kind of broke us up, but it's once you're, 
it's not uncommon for alerts or mission planning or some type of ground duty that you're, you're, you're kind of split. You're not, you're not locked together. It's just, you're kind of paired together. It's not a hard and fast, but it's, it's a general rule kind of thing. And so I go back to days and, but you know, my Wizzo had learned a ton from the time we started until, cause we're probably halfway through by now again. And so experience is there's a, there's less focus and emphasis on the experience has to significantly be offset. Right. And I remember I walked into the squadron. I was supposed to be mission planning that night and you could tell something was going on. The top three would look very upset. The, uh, another fighter pilot there, she was in tears and he's like, Hey, I need you all to come up to the desk. And the top three was actually my first Wizzo for my first combat mission, friend of mine. Right. Top three. Sorry. Top so three. Top three is like the CEO. Almost like the, the duty officer. Ooh, he's, okay. He's the one who's running operations because the commander and the DO are not going to be there all the time. So he's okay. at the desk. He's, he's giving you the information. He's making sure crews step on time and he's running the operation and whatnot. So he's kind of the hub of the squad. Yeah, yeah. And so this was the guy that I flew my first combat mission with. We went back to the training squadron together. Ultimately, he ends up going to weapons school and being the squadron commander of the weapons school squadron later. So, I mean, awesome, sharp dude, right? He's like, hey, I need, to, I need everybody to come over here. And he says, we just had a jet hit the ground. And we, that's all we know. And I'm like, well, what do we do now, right? So I go back to mission planning. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, this sucks. And... I understand now talking to A-10 guys, they'll tell you in a CSAR event, in a combat search and rescue event, if it doesn't have a source and a date and time stamp, it doesn't exist. And I understood why after that, because while I think some people want to help, everybody wants to be involved and the sipper chat's just lighting up. It's everything from there was one shoot, there was two shoots, there was no shoots, they're dead. They're alive. They're captured. They're en route to Iran. I mean, every possible scenario is coming, and you don't know what's true and what's not. And so I'm sitting there, and I wasn't scheduled to fly. And the top three, my friend, comes back, and he's like, "Hey, man, do you have crew rest?" I said, "No, I don't." He's like, "Okay." Like you're not you're not able to fly right? Yeah, now. generally, yeah. Like you've got to have 12 hours off from the time you land. Crew rest required just to make sure you're rested and prepared to take the next flight. Well, the guys that were coming in in about an hour to go fly the next combat lines, because, I mean, combat doesn't stop. Right? A jet hitting the ground is a significant emotional event for a squadron and potentially two lives being lost. But in the grand scheme of things, the war doesn't stop. So the guys coming in the next one were really close to the crews that were airborne. And they didn't want to put them in a jet right after they told them. So... My friend comes back a couple minutes later. He says, hey, are you good to fly? I said, absolutely. I love my sleep. I got eight hours of sleep. I was fed. I was rested. I, said, I would rather be in the jet than sitting here dwelling on this right now. Now, whether it's a compliment or, or not, that, I, that maybe I have a little mental resilience that I, you know, I could compartmentalize that. But you talked about my, my, my background, right? Like I've seen a car versus a train accident. And you have to put those things in a box and compartmentalize it and, and do your job. Right. So I had that ability. He knew that. And he, and so he put me in the mission. Only time I've ever flown without crew rest, but I think it was warranted. And, you know, because now we, we end up finding out they send forces out to the site, realize that there was no survivors and we lost two guys. Yeah. And what was your role in this? They're, they're sending you out to. So to now that. I'm just the next flight airborne. They even told us don't go to the crash site. Oh, it wasn't to go observe or get eyes no. on or anything. It's to it fulfill just the like next combat keep line. Running the now, did we go to the crash site? You bet your ass you bet. we did. <laughs> because at that time we didn't know. Of course. You know? Yeah. Now course. on the downside, the disappointing thing for me personally was one, the jet that crashed. That was my wizard. Yeah. So now. They were training, they were practicing strafe at night. There was the way we did strafe, the systems, the way the system pulled altitudes there. I won't, it was nobody's fault, right? Like it was a, it was a sequence of events that put them in a position 
to that for an accident to happen. We changed some things after that to try to make sure that never happens again, but that's how tactics are made. They're generally yeah, written in they're blood. Written in blood. Yeah. And so, but at Bagram, when, when troops would, would fall, essentially, they'd have a fallen comrade ceremony because they're getting on, they're being put into an airplane to be flown back to the States. I was airborne, not that night, but that week, I did not get to say goodbye because the, the ceremony happened, the next thing I know, they're like, yeah, they're gone. And now, one, the Wizzo, his family was from, I think, somewhere up in the Midwest, not really associated with the military. And- Not he, unlike you. Right, right. human nature is, is natural though, to blame somebody. I, th I think that they, they kind of looked at it as like the military killed my son, and he had two newborn twins. And so they, they kind of like, hey, we're gonna take him and we're gonna do our own thing. The, the pilot, his wife was a military member. She was deployed, so they had to call her and be like, hey, like we need you to come back. And so, but she then waited until the squadron got back. They had a ceremony at the base, but they waited till the squadron got back and then they interred him at Arlington. And we were all able to go and go to Arlington and try to not tell his mom what his call sign was, was based on. So, okay. but, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, a, a, a pretty significant emotional event for the squadron and, uh, you know, unfortunate, but you fly jets long enough, you know, you know some, that's a possibility. Is there any discussion that happens in the squadron after that to just get people focused again? Does that even need to happen? It does, you know, one, you want to reach out and make sure everybody's okay because everybody's going to handle this differently. Some people can keep trucking along. Uh, some people can't. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I try to look at it as, I mean, I think back to what the generation before us went through. I mean, you look at World War II and a third of the squadron to more didn't come back from a mission. And these guys had the courage and the fortitude to do this night after night, after night. And I just, I, like, I owe it to them to, to try to, to try to, to be that brave and courageous, you know? So, but you do, you have to cage everybody. You got to make sure everybody's okay. And then you got to cage everybody. Like it happened. We have a job to do and a responsibility. We owe it to them to do our best every day and to make sure it doesn't happen again, to figure out what happened. And that's what we did. Before we jump to Iraq and Syria, um, you know, I, you had mentioned when we, before we started recording that you were posted to England. One of the things that I think Stinger told us was the history, like the, the history that the Air Force keeps from their time in England at, at the base. I'm just curious, like, um, as you talk about these, these flights that went out, World War II, like, is that kind of where you you learn about that? Is that where the history comes in that the Marine Corps gives you early on? Yeah, I think it's a combination. You know, the, the Marine Corps history is, you know, I mean, way back, right? Before the country was even official. And then all the way through, I mean, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. I mean, there's so much history there and things to unpack. And, and then just really even cinema. You know, yeah. now with cinema and the things they've been able to do to actually recreate, like this is what it was potentially like to where you can actually see and remind people, not just the military members, more of the public. War is terrible. You don't want to be in war, right? So if we can avoid it, let's avoid it. Now, if we have to go to war, we're going to be prepared and we're going to win. But I think we have short memories. And, and if you've never experienced it, then you don't understand it and you might be weighing in on things that, that maybe you shouldn't. So, which, I mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion. That's what I love about our country is you know, freedom of speech. You know, that's one of the beautiful things, but you've got to be prepared to also listen to somebody say something that you don't want to hear. I've heard that from several of the guests that we've had on here from the air force that the, the bar, whether it's the officer's club or, whatever it is, downrange, um, back home, that, that that's where a lot of the, the lessons are shared and, and the stories are told, but l less from a, an ego perspective, more from like, hey, this is what happened when I was up there, this is what I heard, or from an old timer 
Do you have any of those that you remember from uh, from your time serving? No specific stories, but you could tell there was some really good mentors I had that, you know, they would. They'd be like, hey, debrief's over. Let's go to the bar. Like Friday night at the bar, you'd, you'd learn as much there as you'd learn on any given mission, right? Because guys are just talking about their experiences. And that's how we learn is through experience, whether it's mine, whether it's theirs. But as, if you can un- understand it and internalize it, and yeah, the bar was a great place to learn and it's casual, right? It's not a formal debrief. So a young, a young wingman or a young wizzo, they're probably going to be more inclined to ask a question standing in the bar than they are in the middle of their debrief, right? And so, and normally it was the weapons officers kind of building that type of environment to be like, hey man, let's go to the bar, let's chat. Right. And it was so frustrating because one of my mentors, he was the weapons officer in the squadron. And, you know, you're short on time and you just have a quick question. You know, he knows it. Like, hey, man, I got to ask you this question. What is this? He'd be like, well, let's go look it up. You're like, oh, no, dude, don't teach a man to fish. Like, I just need to know. I just need to know, you know. And, <laughs> don't teach and, a man uh, to fish. <laughs> and so like, let's go look it up because he wants you to learn. Yeah. Right. He doesn't just want to sure. give you the answer, but which was great. But sometimes you're like, oh, I just need the answer, man. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk 2014, okay. um, Iraq, Syria. Um, can you take us through kind of what, what's your role at the time? Clearly, you've been through the weapons school. Yeah. So at this point, so I spent four years in my first ops squadron, and then I went over to the training squadron. I spent a total of about two years there, but the last six months of that was I got to go to the weapons school, and amazing experience. One of the greatest things you don't want to do twice. Uh, similar to Paris Island. <laughs> And, but great experience. I mean, it's just, it's the resources they have to dedicate. You can, you can't replicate that in a normal squadron. They just don't exist there. So it's not that I'm so much better because that I, that I got to go to the weapons school. It's more that the resources there made me better because it can put me through more experiences. And at that point, it's not about you. You're the, you're the lead instructor. You're the weapons and tactics expert. You're the one that, that shapes the squadron from a training and a tactics perspective. And so that's, it's a lead role to do that. So I was in, I went to England and uh, consequently, the, 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 again, the, the Wizzo from my first combat sortie who was the top three the night of the crash, he's the weapons officer in the squadron that I come to and now he's the lead, I'm next to him as the, we're dual weapons officers. And then he leaves and Paco comes in and he and I are the weapons officers. Paco is Mike, who we're going to yeah. meet later. Yeah. So, and so then as my time as the lead is waning, they say, well, you can either go to be a flight commander in the squadron, or you can go to be the chief of wing weapons. I had not been a flight commander previously. It was just something that timing wise didn't work out. And so I knew that was a gap in some of my skill sets as far as writing performance reports and things like that. So I felt doing that would be valuable. So I was a flight commander for a little while. Well, then we're going to deploy. Well, they said, we need a chief of wing weapons at the deployed location. And so I took that job. So it's a little bit of a weird environment because now my squadron that I work with at home is deployed to that location, my squadron commander, my DO, but I'm actually detached and I'm working for the group commander and the wing commander as the chief of wing weapons and mission planning. And hierarchically, that squadron you were a part of reports up to the group and to the wing. group and the wing commander. So you're the wing weapons officer. Yes. So you you've elevated from the the squadron Correct. weapons officer to, to multiple the, squadrons. Yeah, to the group, yeah, to the multiple squadrons, multiple platforms. And so, and I'm working with the KAOC then. To, combined Air Ops Center. Yeah, the Combined right? Air Ops Center, which is down in IUD, so we're geographically separated, but I'm their focal point working with Intel to do mission planning. Now, at the time, Afghanistan was really scaled back, so I'm still flying with the squadron, my home squadron. They just deployed, and my commander was awesome because he says, hey, man, I know you, you don't really work for me while we're here, and just realize that I understand that, and you have other responsibilities. Yeah. I mean, great leadership, great leadership. And the group commander was phenomenal because he, because then I had a, I was in an operational support squadron. So I had another squadron commander deployed. He was an F-16 guy. He says, dude, you work for the group commander, backfill me when you can. And he was awesome. So, I mean, I just had some phenomenal 
leadership. And the group commander is like, dude, you do your thing and you let me know when you need my help. And so it took me a couple of weeks to, to really figure out my role, right? Because I was just given, so all, much flexibility I was given and, all this flexibility and authority to yeah. engage directly with the Air Ops Center. And, but at the time, really, Afghanistan was the only thing going on. And it was only four, six jets a day. So we were doing actually a lot of training. There was F-22s in the country. We had F-15Es. We had some ODAs. We had helicopters. And so we were trying to get the best training we could based on the airspace and the aircraft we had in theater. We were focusing a lot on CSAR uh, just because we felt that was a skill set we needed to increase. The other thing was just based on limitations of the airspace, we were having the F-22s provide air, air protection from a lower generation aircraft threat just because we didn't have the range to train to a bigger one while we were doing CSAR and close air support beneath them. And some of the guys were like, oh, this is unrealistic. This would never happen. And it's not that we were clairvoyant, but lo and behold, ISIS starts to become a bigger thing. And now we had some diplomatic hurdles to get over because when you're based out of a country, they have to give you approval to fly combat missions out of there. So uh, I remember we started flying missions up into Iraq and that we weren't, you weren't employing at that point. ISIS was, they're parking their, their equipment. They're waving their flags. They're giving you the finger, you know, I mean, they're wide out in the open. And finally the line was drawn. And I clearly remember the day that that all changed, that they crossed the line, the ROE changed. What do you remember from that day? Uh, I remember that the, the Hornets off the boat were the first ones in and the first ones to, to go kinetic because they don't have diplomatic clearances and they were they can just go right in. Because they were on the boat. Yep, they're on the yeah, boat, they're in international waters and they just go right into Iraq. Uh, and I remember being, we were orbiting over this town and the ISIS was sitting in a truck and a couple vehicles with their flags and their weapons and, and we dropped a small diameter bomb and you talk about accuracy, it hit right in the bed of this pickup truck that they were using as a technical and it flipped the truck over and and had some pretty good blast effects. And everything changed at that point because now they realized it's on. And so they had to adapt their tactics. But now that we had smaller weapons, we had a lot more UAVs. So we could, we could employ in other places that historically we may not have been able to in urban environments. And, and then that started to shift. And, and now really the mission became it's full combat ops. Right. So now we start getting into combat operations versus training. And now Syria starts to come into play. And because ISIS is kind of cross, cross ISIS border, is crossed. Right? Yeah. They're, they're operating they're, out of Syria, but they're Iraq in Iraq. And Syria. I mean, they are in Iraq. And we start to push them back. And so the ops into Syria was a big question from the Air Ops Center's perspective because there was multiple courses of action. Do we just do all like cruise missile standoff munitions and nobody ever goes into Syria? Do we go into Syria with maybe stealth forces and leave the conventional forces outside? Or do we push everybody in? And it, it kind of became a mix. And so as chief of wing weapons, this was one of the challenging things because when everything started kicking off, I talked to my boss who was the group commander and I said, Hey, sir, like, do I have to be in mission planning all the time or can I go do some missions? And he said, he said, I trust you. You go where you think you need to be. I said, okay. So the, the, com the, the com combatant commander says, we're going to go strike ISIS in Syria. And it was a big planning thing you know so we're all intel mission planning which i'm coordinating we're doing all that the mission commander was a b1 uh, pilot down at, at iud the strike package commander was uh, paco who was the squadron weapons officer at uh, the strike eagles and so there was all this planning i mean i remember standing in the back of the room as the brief was going on for the the air component commander because there was press there was like cameras it's f-22 combat debut and sorry, they're not all in the same room doing this planning. It's remote, it's, like yeah, it's Paco's all separate. somewhere. You got <laughs> yeah, pa I can't wow. remember if he went down to the Kayak or or not, but yeah, because everybody's separated, and and so, and then everybody goes out to do this mission, you know. And I'm back, like man, like I really wish I was there, you know. So it, it's hard, but that's where they needed me. You know, sometimes your support, sometimes your tip of the spear, and mm -hmm. so, but. 
next thing you know, they're like, what are we doing tomorrow? And they're like, I don't know. What are we doing? We need a mission commander. So they call up to, to Aldafra and they said, hey, do you guys, and I answer the phone because I'm chief wing weapons. And they say, hey, do you guys have a mission commander for tomorrow night? And I look around. I absolutely have a mission commander for a mile <laughs> night and it's this guy. So, uh, and, and it was really cool because now you're talking a multinational coalition. You're talking about the UAE, Saudi Arabia, the U S uh, I can't remember if Bahrain was involved or not. I mean, you're talking about the ship forces, a massive thing, right? And this is what you train for at weapon school. So going this back is to the that, combined, yeah, this is you yeah. know multinational, massive package large force like we're going to go in and strike targets and the goal for night two of the attacks into syria were to degrade their money-making capability by taking out their oil production mm -hmm. what was night one just for context for i think a lot of it remember. was command and control and, uh, and that kind of so, thing okay. taking out those kind yeah. of targets so we we planned it we we went up and and it was awesome i mean it was it was really cool to work with the Emiratis, the Saudis, and all these different nations. And again, we're geographically separated. So all this coordination is happening and we're sending it out over the networks and, and to the liaisons at all the different bases to make sure that the message gets across. And we get airborne, we get to go for the mission, and the mission goes pretty well. There's always hiccups, right? Especially as the airborne mission commander. You know, and How many so, aircraft are we talking about? Probably 30. Is that multinational? Yeah. Taken off from different locations? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Meet, I mean, it's like meet up at a certain time. These are your physical lo or like geographic locations you're going to stage. These are your altitudes. It's it's all planned. Everybody shows up. You rally. You get I, ready I'm to go. A, yeah. I'm amazed slash impressed on that. And yeah. it's even then deconflicted. Like I had the Emirati Mirages had targets and then the M Emirati F-16 had targets. And so you're like, okay, well, we're going to push the Mirages in first. They're going to drop laser guided bombs. They're then going to egress the area. And then the Mirage or then the F-16s are going to come in. And then the Strike Eagles are going to come in and go further to these targets. And so it's, it's very choreographed, but you have to be flexible as well. So we had extra weapons in case some of the targets didn't get struck for whatever reason. And, and then what was really weird is once the bulk of the mission happened, they told us that they wanted to send a two ship of strike eagles alone and unafraid all the way into Syria over by Aleppo, which the previous night is where we had the F-22s. And they wanted us to go to a place called Kobani because they, they thought there was a humanitarian situation going on. So nobody had ever heard of Kobani at that point. And so I'm like, really? We're just going by ourselves? I'm like, okay. And I mean, we were out of radio range of the command and control. We were using SATCOM. And we went to Kobani and it was almost like one of those scenes from a movie, like an apocalyptic movie where you had the fence between Syria and Turkey and the town of Kobani. And it's just all these cars all toward this gate in the fence that are just abandoned. And and there wasn't a whole lot going on, but we could tell something was happening. And I mean, we were getting spiked by SA-2s and SA-5, which are surface to air systems that Syria had. No. Had, had that happened to you before? No. What's the feeling the first time you get one of those? It's not a good feeling, but you can't panic. And because the likelihood of them launching on us was somewhat low you hope right but we we had tactics we were like if they launch on us here's what we're going to do to defend against it right there was a russian jet that probably thought the same thing not not True. too long they later weren't in, they weren't in at the time <laughs> yeah right? we didn't have to deal with yeah, that luckily right. but uh and so yeah we saw kabani i mean ultimately we went back to kabani later you know late months later because realizing that there was massive stuff going on on there i mean i think the town elders told the u.s that they'll they'll let us burn it to the ground before they let them have it. So, And, and what was your reason for going out there? You we said were, there's a humanitarian we thing were, going on, but there was some, the chaos said they were getting word. There was like a humanitarian crisis going on and they wanted some sensors to get the uh, picture to see what's going on. Cause we didn't have any forces there. So, so they sent us in. They don't send like a drone for that or no. I don't know. <laughs> well, we were already, already going to be there. Here, right? Yeah. So. Wow. Um, when, when you're flying in on that second night, does it get kinetic as you're taking out the money making? Oh yeah. yeah. It was, it was actually pretty interesting because 
we were dropping SDB. You know, you had a compound. And in that compound, you've got the oil, the makeshift oil refinery where they're refining it. And then you've got a trailer. And there's probably a guy living in that trailer who's not a radical. He, he just wants to live his life and raise his family like you and I. But if he doesn't do this, they're going to kill him. And so we actually took very great lengths and pains to try to preserve that. So we actually delayed fused the small diameter bombs so that they could take out the oil refinery. And, and we have the before and after pictures where you see the compound intact. And the next picture is the oil refinery has gone. The buildings over here are intact. And, but I mean, it, I'll tell you what, it was almost like a nuke went off when the bombs hit. I mean, the whole lower half below the horizon was just orange because it was oil yeah because of the explosion and the, the gas explosion when i mean i even like dipped the wing but oh my gosh and i mean lit up the sky underneath the airplane when it went off it was pretty impressive Jeez, how rewarding was that you know you mentioned like hey i gotta stay back this first time it was really rewarding down. you know that was the whole that's what you're trained for at the weapon school. So being able to have that kind of culminate because a lot of guys don't get that kind of opportunity. And not that I'm so great because any one of the guys in my squadron or gals, they could have done that role as well. Yeah, you know, it, but you go where you're asked to go and you step up when you're put in that position to do so. So I took it on gladly. It was very rewarding to get that experience and, and have it be successful and, and turn out well. And really that purpose part, right? Because now like taking away their money-making capabilities, you know, hopefully that's making a dent. It was easy to not like ISIS, right? Like it, they made it really easy on that one. Do you get debriefed by the weapons school after that? Because training's training, but like no, that type of... So some of it, you actually go back to the weapon school sometimes and can tell them like, Hey, here's what we've done. And so yeah. every weapons officer is invited back. Like you can always go back to the weapon school. Yeah, that's pretty cool. To where every class that graduates, you're invited back to patch night when they actually put, the, cause there's graduation on the weekend, but patch night is what you really care about, right? Wait, what's the difference? So Patch night is the night you get your patch. It's a squadron event. It's a more intimate event because it's the squadron. It's all the instructors and students that you've been flying with for six months. Families and, or no? No. Okay. And <laughs> no. And, you know, they tell jokes, they make fun of you. And ultimately, one of the instructors you will have picked to patch you, and he will have worn a patch for you for the last few weeks of training. And then he will put your patch on you. And that's when you become a weapons officer. And for example, like my wife was back home with my son, right? And she's like, do you want me to come out for graduation? I said, you're welcome to come out for graduation. But patch night means more to me than graduation, right? And so I didn't think she was coming. And so the instructors, they're like, okay, we need to know who's coming for graduation. And I'm like, yeah, nobody. I'm like, well, what do you mean nobody? Like, this is a big deal. I'm like, nah, nobody's coming. They're like, your wife's not coming? I'm like, no. Well, one of the instructors had been a former weapons officer of mine and mentor and friend. And so him and one of the other students who was a friend of mine actually coordinated behind the scenes with my wife and made up a fake name for somebody else's guest to be coming <laughs> to sit at our table. And, you know, I remember because apparently she landed, they picked her up and he calls me. He's like, hey, let's go to lunch. I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I'm, I'm just kind of hanging out. I got some stuff to do. He's like, no, no, you're going to lunch with me. And I'm like, nah, I'm fine. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> he's like, shut up. I'll be there in 15 minutes. And he shows up and my wife's in the car. Right? Yeah. And so uh, so they surprised me. That's but, cool. But yeah. Graduations where it's the whole weapon school. It's the formal event. You're in your, you know, your tuxedo uniform and they present the certificates and that kind of thing. But like patch nights, what really resonated with me of, of getting your patch and, and, and every weapons officer is invited. They read the role of all the weapons officers. And so, I mean, you know, several like mentors of mine flew down for our patch night and wow. we're there and uh, you're always invited back. And so as part of that, they'll do, you can do briefs of like, Hey, our squadron just got back from deployment. And so some, the weapons officer will go kind of talk to the guys in the weapons school of like, here's what we were doing. Here's the tactics we developed. Here's the weapons we're using. And, 
and so that they can then propagate that. Do you get to wear that patch later? You wear it for that, the rest of your career. You know, so it, it's no matter like where you're at, that's going to be somewhere on your uniform it is. at some point. Yeah, it's normally on your left shoulder. So when, is that your last deployment, 2014? It was. So after that deployment, we I stayed because I was with the wing. The squadron left. The next squadron came in. And so I was part of that continuity to, to bring them in. And also when the F-22 swapped out, uh, I was a part of that swap out, briefing them on some things. And then I ended up going home and not, it was only five months later that I was, I was leaving and I was PCSing. So, but before that had happened, before the deployment, the squadron commander says, what do you want to do next? I'm like, what do you want to do for your next assignment? And, you know, you can go teach the weapon school, you can go to another ops unit, or you can go into operational test. And He's like, or if like if you want to be a general, we can go find you a high profile job to try to get you to school and promoted and and you know to be a general. And I was like, that was never the goal. So I, I want to do something, right? But you were on the trajectory. If you wanted to, there's a chance you could have gone that route. There was a chance, but I was not what they would call a school select, meaning it was guaranteed to go to the next higher level school. So I would have had to compete for it which is what he cautioned me about. He said, look, if you go to, to the test wing, that's predominantly weapon school graduates. So rather than being the one or two in a squadron, it's, all, it's harder to compete, right? Like now you're talking about, you're competing against top level people across the board. He said, I, you may not go to school. I said, that's, I would rather go do something than try to be somebody, if that makes sense. And so uh, I went to test. I was fortunate enough out of there that I ended up getting pushed for school and I got selected for school. And, but I, I really liked test test. Versus, yeah, what is test? So, you know, you think the right stuff, Chuck Yeager, right back in the day and you had test pilots. Well, in 1974, Congress said, Hey, we are testing things and pushing into the field because sometimes it's the telephone game. The warfighter says, I need this. Well, by the time that gets translated between the engineer, the acquisitions, the contracting, by the time it gets to the warfighter, it's not what they asked for and it's not usable. Some things are better, some things are not. And so Congress said, look, we're sending things to the field that aren't what the warfighter wants or needs. You have to have a warfighter look at something before it goes to the field. So test was broken up. You have developmental test, which is the blue patch test pilot school graduates that go for a year to test pilot school. And they are validating spec compliance. Like, does this do what we asked them to make it do? And they make those, that data and those recommendations to the acquisition decision authorities, which can go all the way up to the Secretary of Defense. And then you once they say, yes, it's meet spec, we think it's good to go, they push it over to operational test, which are warfighters. It doesn't have to be a weapons school graduate, but many of them are. And they then put it through operational scenarios and use it like you would use it in combat to say, is this suitable and effective for what we need it to do or is it not? And so it's, it's, it's a little different than ops because in ops, you're building people. Like I said, the weapons school graduate, his, his goal is to teach the next generation, to shape that next generation and, and make them as good as him and make instructors and make flight leads and keep the squadron going. So you're building people. Whereas you go to test, you're building combat capability for the future. So it's the long game. It's, it's different, but it's still a very valuable and rewarding mission. And so I went to test, went to school, but then I worked a deal to come back to the test community. And we're actually in the F-15 community. That developmental and operational test, we are really crossing streams and combining it because Otherwise, by the time the operational guys look at it, it's too late to fix it or change anything. So now we're trying to mix it. And so now we've got a really great integrated team down at, at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida and working with the guys out at Nellis that we have operators looking at things early on as it's being developed so they can have that input and we can shape it and we field it to the warfighter earlier, cheaper, and a better product. Is it... Anything from like maybe a new type of munition, radio, aircraft, like how broad is 
Uh, it's the it's everything, but so it's broken up though. You've got a squadron that kind of focuses on a lot of the weapons and other support capabilities. And then you've got a couple squadrons that have multiple platforms, but there's a test management and then a test execution. So test execution is more like the flying squadron, the pilots, the wizards, whereas test management is a lot of your analysts, engineers, program managers, a lot of the acquisitions piece that has to be done as well. But but they work hand in hand, but it's everything from the software suite that gets updated every year or two, the radar upgrades, the targeting pod, the new central computer in the airplane, the electronic warfare systems. I mean, anything that's going to go on the platform, uh, even to the F-15EX, you know, we were- The platform the, itself. The, the, yeah, the, the, which, I mean, I think of the F-15EX, a lot of the systems and sensors going in are the same ones we were upgrading the other F-15s with. It's just now you've got a new- chassis that has digital flight controls, an upgraded cockpit, better engines, and a 25,000 hour life. So you're, you're at the cutting edge of what's coming out technology wise. For like a this. lot of things. Yeah. It's still, it's still, you know, F-15 based, which is somewhat of an older platform, but, but yeah, you're bringing, you're fielding that capability to the warfighter, which is just rewarding in and of itself. And I was fortunate enough to still be there when we brought the F-15EX online and I had the opportunity to fly that. Was it a noticeable difference? Significantly. Well, how so for the layman, I guess? Well, what for one, the screens in the F-15E are 480 by 480 monochrome with one color in the front and two colors in the back. I feel like it's the same thing in that rig in the Apache. <laughs> but they're also analog. Yeah, so the, okay. the you saw an article that say the most advanced computer in a fighter is in the F-15. But we paid extra to dumb it down to have an analog output for our 480 by 480 monochrome displays. The F-15EX has a full digital large area display, multi-configuration uh, cockpit that you can adjust. So newer, more advanced, more capable, awesome, right? It's got newer engines that have more power. Uh, I was, we, me and Paco, were at 40,000 feet, 1.5 Mach, and we did an Immelman, which is a pull up front half of a loop to 50,000 feet, which you couldn't do in a regular. Jeez. Okay. It carries more missiles. Uh, it's just, it's got digital flight controls versus old uh, cable and, and analog. I mean, it's, it's a newer aircraft body with all the new advanced sensors. Why did they, just out of curiosity, why do they still call it the F-15? It sounds like a like, is there something in it that makes it so close to the F-15? Like well, it is. Single seat. So the F-15E for the U.S., we stopped buying those, I think, in the mid-2000s. But Boeing kept the line open because, I want to say, Korea, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Singapore, Qatar have bought them. So they've, they've still been selling them. And it's based on the E model. Now, you don't have to put the rear cockpit in if you don't want to. You can fly it single seat if you want to. So they've got a business model that allows for that, but it's still the same overall airplane. They've done some different things. Upgrades have happened over the years. When they do those sales to foreign countries, mostly it's through foreign military sales. So the government's involved, but, but Saudi Arabia, the, they paid for a digital flight control upgrade. At some point, the engines were upgraded. The the whole new cockpit redesign was part of the Qatari sale. So we, with all these upgrades that have happened along the way through the foreign military sales, we leveraged that $5 billion of FMS money that's come in to upgrade it that now we've taken advantage of by buying it yeah. now. Mm -hmm. What is, what's the decision for you to get out eventually? It was a lot of things. The, some of it is as you, you know, when you're a young lieutenant or captain, you think, oh, if the generals only knew the problems, they would fix them, right? I, I feel like that hasn't changed <laughs> from like the Spartans to any level of military. Yeah. But yeah. as you get closer to the generals and you start realizing they know the problems, but everything at some point becomes political. When the DOD says this is what's right for our country. But then it gets to Congress and it becomes a, well, that's not going to get me reelected. And then things change. And so you start to see that. And I was, a, there was a four-star general and he was having lunch with a bunch of squadron commanders. And he says, hey, 
you know, like, hey, what's something that I can potentially help you with? And I said, General, don't take this the wrong way, but my problems are above your pay grade. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And he says, I hear you. He goes, I get it. Right. And he didn't take offense. I mean, luckily he knew me. He yeah. was one of my early squadron commanders. And, and, you know, I said, these are my problems and I don't think you can solve them. And so a little bit of frustration, right? Um, my goal was to be a lieutenant colonel and a DO, and I had already passed that. Combine that with I went in a little older because I had previous careers. So now if I'm going to have a follow on career, do I do it in my late forties or do I delay it to my mid fifties? And the big question would be why, like, what's my purpose? Because uh, I had a really great group commander that took a bunch of squadron commanders and we went to the personnel center and they, cause everything prior to that's always like how to get to squadron command. Well, then they, pulled back the curtain and said, here's what your life looks like now to try to get to general. And they laid it out. And I'm like, that sucks. That doesn't look fun. In what way? They're going to take you out of the cockpit. First, you're going to go to Step school. Step one. Well, first you're going to go to school. And honestly, yeah. school was a great experience. The problem is you commit to three-year commitment after that, and you don't know what they're going to do with you. You're going to go to a staff job. It may be great. It may be terrible. So you're going to be out of the cockpit, which can be good and bad. You're going to do the staff job. If you get promoted, now you're going to be in a penalty lab for a year while they game plan you essentially to get you a joint staff position to get the joint qualification. And then you're going to potentially be uh, maybe a deployed group commander or vice wing commander for a year or whatnot, just, just to then become a wing commander and be joint qualified at, to be able to be a general. And, and that was never my goal, right? So you've got to look at what's my why, what's my purpose. Now, that's half of the coin. The other half of the coin is my wife has been phenomenal. She has supported me and, and our family 150% for the last 18 years. It happened to coincide. Again, we do big life events all at once. My son, I was finishing command. I had 21 years of total service. My son's graduating high school. It just seemed like the right time to retire shift to a new career, set down some roots, give my son somewhere to come back to and be able to get a home that we could host family at. Cause we hadn't really had a lot of that opportunity moving around in the military. And, and so those, when you pro and con it out, other than that connection to the military, which I felt a very strong pull toward, it was overwhelmingly the pros were to get out and start a follow on career just from a stability, a stress, I find I financial perspective. I mean, just from earning potential, all the pros leaned toward getting out and retiring. So that was the decision we made. And it was funny because I was trying to delay it because I was like, ah, you know, I don't know. And, and my wife's like, you know, you just need to make a decision. And we were having a conversation over lunch one day on a Sunday. And she's, she's like, what do you think? I'm like, I'm just going to retire. She said, okay. I went in the next morning. I sent an email to my boss. I said, Hey boss, Thank you for all the support. And I know you're trying to get me to school in this, but I'm retiring. I just want to let you know. And then I went into the personnel system and I clicked retire. Wow. And set the date. What was it? And no brainer to go into flying still afterwards? It was. I mean, there was still a lot of pull to stay in connected to the military and the test community. We hired a lot of retired air crew to be the experts because there's a pilot shortage. And when the pilots are flying part of the time or TDY and those engineers and analysts need real time feedback from air crew and they don't have it. So we hire retired air crew to be those subject matter experts. So it would have been, it would have been very fulfilling and easy to, to go into that, but I didn't want to be in an eight to five Monday through Friday job. And so, and, and I love flying. So it was, it was from a lifestyle perspective, from a, a financial perspective, it just made sense to transition to the airlines as a pilot. What, what have you found to be the um, most enjoyable part of this new career path? Uh, a few things. One, the travel, because it opens up a lot of travel opportunities. I probably work about 13 to 14 days a month, and, and which is less than I did before. And honestly, the stress, my stress level is so low. Not that it's not important when you're carrying 200 people and their lives are in your hands, but you're trained. It's, it's, I would not say it's not hard, but once you have that kind of experience, you, you know what you're doing. And, 
And my biggest stress is my son in college and figuring out where my wife and I are going to eat on our days off for lunch, you know? And so uh, that's really enjoyable. But you fly with great people, which is similar to the military. But unlike the military, I may fly with another pilot and then not see them ever for months to years later. Wow. Whereas in the military, you work with the same team. And we had such a great team I worked with for four years that that was hard to give up. And I mean, I, I try to think of myself as pretty resilient. You know, I went on terminal leave for almost two months over the summer and I knew where my next job was. I was financially sound. Like this was a plan made a decade ago. And I still felt that what is my purpose getting up? I was trying to burn time. Like I'd get up, go work out a couple hours, go get lunch, just try to burn half a day. And, and I even felt some of that, like, what's my purpose now? So that really opened my eyes to the issue of when veterans get out or retire and struggle. And I had a plan and I knew what I was yeah. doing. And so that really resonated with me and, and I get it. And I can see how that would be a real struggle for people. How have you managed it? It seems like you have. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a short-term thing. Like I said, I just kept myself busy over the summer, spent time with my son before he went off to college. And, and once I started working, I only wanted to take about four weeks off, but you know, I was, it was really whenever they could bring me on board. So, but once I started working, you know, I dropped my son off at college and three days later I started at my new job. So, uh, and at that point we're, you know, we're all in a Tuesday's a Saturday. I barely know what day of the week it is half the time. <laughs> um, what do you miss most from your time in the military? The team, the, the, the guys and gals around you. I mean, just that camaraderie that, and it's not that I don't have that at my new job. It's just, you know, the, it's hard to recreate that. Yeah. I mean, the, supporting the warfighter, that shared experience and uh, that connection to that higher purpose. No, I mean, I'm still in uniform. I still provide a valuable service, but it's, it's just different. And that's what I miss. But I also know that it was time. Mm -hmm. What was the most courageous or brave thing that you witnessed? While you were flying, or maybe not even while you were flying, but your time in uniform. Uh, nothing specific, but the guys on the ground. I mean, the bravery of the guys on the ground to go out every day and and try to to. I mean, it sounds cliche, but you know, support freedom and push freedom throughout the globe, and be willing to put their life on the line to do that. And the trust that they had in us to drop pretty pretty massive weapons in their area, but the trust knowing that, that we were doing it to help them and that we were going to do the best we could for them. And even some courageous things I saw, not even necessarily from a combat perspective, but on the ground, I was fortunate to have phenomenal leadership examples throughout my career. And, you know, I, I know one squadron commander, we were deployed, we were having some maintenance issues. We weren't flying as many lines as we should have been. And the guys in the squadron were struggling to stay current. Well, we had a lot of attached flyers throughout the wing that wanted to fly as well. And the squadron commander, who was a lower ranking than a lot of these guys, he went in and he said, I don't have to fly you. I don't have to fly you. I don't have to fly you. And he's like, I'm struggling to keep our crews current and you're complaining about not flying. And he stood up to them. And that was, that was to me, that was very brave and courageous because yeah, he's, he's, he's doing the right thing, yeah. right? And that's what I noticed is, the such good leadership I had and some of the best leaders were it was the guys that weren't concerned, like they, making the next rank or their career was not the forefront of their decision thought process. It was, I'm going to do the right thing. And so that's the example I tried to follow. You were in a lot of roles, right? I mean, we just weapons officer, squadron commander, DO, um, you know, you've been in many roles. What was, what was your favorite role? My favorite was being a weapons officer in the squadron because it's the impact, right? It's people want mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Well, going through the weapons school should get you to that mastery point. Now you're always learning. You know, when I was a lieutenant, became a or a captain, became a new instructor. I thought I I thought I was the heat, right? Like <laughs> I'm an I'm an instructor. I'm awesome. Then I went to the training squadron and learned that I didn't know the half of it. Right. And then I became a training squadron instructor. And then I'm thinking, okay, like I'm I'm pretty good, right? Like I'm I'm training squadron instructor. I know a lot. Then I went to the weapons school. 
They're like, I didn't know anything, right? And then you think, okay, I'm a weapon school graduate, right? Like Top Gun 2. And they're like, who's going to teach us, right? And so then I go to test. And then I learn what the jet's doing. But I'm like, I didn't know anything, right? You can, you can always learn. There is always something new to learn. And I take that in my job now. I try to learn something on every trip I take, whether it's about the airplane, the operation, whatever. Right. And so as a weapons officer in the squadron, I think that's probably when I was at the peak of my skills, having just come out of weapons school and then, you know, mastery, autonomy and purpose autonomy. I had great leadership that gave me the flexibility and the freedom to shape the tactics and the training as I saw fit and, and my team. I mean, it wasn't just me, right. It's a, it's a, For sure. it's a group project and then purpose, right? Like you see your impact when you take somebody who just got to the squadron and you, you, over the course of an assignment, take them from a wingman to a flight lead, to an instructor, to then eventually they go to the weapon school. And that's what, that's the point. That's the goal. And so, and from a WIZO to an instructor WIZO to the weapon school, or if they don't want to go again, the weapon school is not the end all be all, yeah. but if that's their goal, like how can Getting I get there. you there? And how can I make you the best you can be as an air crew? as an officer, as a person, you know, how can I impact you in a positive way? And I, and that was really, you're building people. And that was, it was very rewarding. It was a lot of work. I mean, it was 12 hour days minimum. And my wife knew, like I would try to block a, an hour in the morning or an hour in the evening to spend with my wife and son. And then weekends were family time. But, you know, she understood the sacrifice and, and that I felt it was worth it. But I don't think I've heard mastery, autonomy, purpose. Is that Part of the weapon school? Doctor, uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to think where that came from. It was, I'm not a super big nonfiction reader. It might have been when I was at Air Command and Staff School, or I've heard it somewhere. I'll have to Google it because somebody wrote a book or a thesis yeah. on it that that's kind of like the way you said that, it. I was like, they must have like, you know, tra- this must be like some no, of the. It, I definitely learned it in a curriculum, but it wasn't the weapon school. Because <laughs> I, I like it. It's I'm more from a it. person's perspective, yeah. right? That, oh, there, that, that's, if you can give people those three things, it, and it might've been in command, in commander school training, because they always were like, look, purpose, like mastery comes with time. I'll t- give people autonomy. No one wants a micromanager, right? And then purpose. And so when I was a squadron commander, I tried to connect everybody in the squadron with a, the purpose of the mission. Because how do you take somebody who is an IT person in the unit working on networks behind closed doors, how do you connect them to the mission? But I would pull up articles because we were responsible for test management of F-15s and F-16s. And if you watch the news or any articles over the course of a month, you can probably find an article or two about something going on with that. And I would put it on a slide and go, this is what you're contributing to. Like Ukraine kicked off. F-15s went over to Europe. You know, Iraq and Syria, F-15s and F-16s were over there. You know, pretty much when things happen, these jets are getting deployed and, or you see something about an upgrade we're doing. And I'm like, this is what you're contributing to. I don't care if you're a civilian, a contractor, a military, active duty, reservist, if you're in the unit, you're contributing to that mission. And so I would try to connect them to that purpose because too many times people work a job and they never get to talk to somebody that uses their product. And so they don't get that connection. And I learned that when I was in test because when I went and talked to the people that built the fuses, they're like, hey, can you come talk to our factory workers? Because they build these fuses and they never get to talk to the end user and they never get feedback or to hear how great a job they're doing. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's important. I must love hearing that. Um, the, the last two questions that I try to ask everybody, one is, is there anything that you carried with you in the cockpit or that you had in your, uh, wherever you were living when you were deployed that had sentimental value, something that somebody gave you that you just wanted to have on you or nearby, maybe a good luck charm or just something you wanted nearby. With so you. random things I carried over the years, uh, have you ever heard of flat Stanley? Yeah. So you got a little kid. The yep. little, so I carried that. Like a little, my, cut out yeah, a little cutout picture of a character. Son that he colored in when he was in you know grade school and I carried that on a deployment. I think I've got a picture in the cockpit with him tucked in my G suit. <laughs> uh, I always had an, an RMO on me, which for, for those that don't know, that's a round metal object, otherwise known as a, a coin, a squadron coin. <laughs> and once I became a weapons officer, I always carried my, my weapons officer coin with me. But for combat, I have a, I have a flag that I got 
on my first deployment and I have flown every combat mission with it. Now I've had other flags that I have flown for my family members, my son, like Christmas yeah. or Christmas Eve or whatever, but I have that flag that, uh, that has flown on every mission with me and I don't have it yet. I've been a little behind on, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do for my memory box and whatnot. Uh, I've got some pretty cool mementos. I've got tail flashes, which is like the the vertical tail of the F-15 on my wall. <laughs> it's awesome. When I finished squadron command and retired, they gave me a 20 millimeter Gatling gun barrel that was uh, painted like oh, an American flag mounted so on a jealous. plaque. And my squadron even took a piece of the ejection seat headrest and actually custom painted it with my call sign and our Friday patch for the squadron and gave that to me as a gift. And that's all in my office. And, uh, but I need to make my shadow box. And I think I just found one. It's in the cutout of an F-15 and in the center of it's going to go that flag. That's cool. That's very cool. And the last thing I ask everybody, looking back 20 plus years, as you mentioned, Marines, you did the law enforcement, um, obviously some hairy situations as a fighter pilot, lost people that you knew and were close to, lots of time from family. As you look back on that time, would you go back and do that again? Absolutely. I mean, people ask me what I would do differently. I don't know that I could answer that I would do anything differently because I'd be afraid that it would change the course. And I've done so many great things and I've lived so many of my dreams and been afforded the opportunity and been lucky enough to to live my dreams that I can't I couldn't go back and change it because I mean look at where I'm at I've got a wonderful wife I've got a wonderful son I've got great memories and experiences and friends and and I've done amazing things that you know I've done more than anybody could hope to so so no I wouldn't do it I would, I would do it all over again perfect Thanks so much for the time, Tom. Absolutely. This is super fun. I can't wait to uh, to have you and Mike sitting here talking about some crazy. Yeah, you say that now. Some crazy roles. Yeah, no, no, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much for the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. Obviously, um, we're on a, an F-15 kick. We'll have Mike Paco Benitez next, who you've heard Tom refer to a couple times in our discussion. But Mike and Tom go way back as um, pilot and Wizzo in the F-15, weapon officers at their squadrons, um, whereas Mike or Paco is a Wizzo or weapon systems officer um, sitting in the back seat. Tom was a front seater. So we'll go through, we'll talk to Paco twice. And then we'll also talk to uh, both of them, Tom and Paco together, which will be exciting. But if you do have time, please leave a comment, uh, give us a thumbs up, a uh, five-star review on Apple. All of that goes a long way to getting us more traction and in front of more people and subscribe and put on those notifications so you get all of our episodes when they're coming out. Um, I do want to say a quick reminder that if you're interested, you can get a weekly, very short newsletter from us. It's Combat Story dot com slash newsletter it's got what we're working on this week our most recent episode what's coming up something i'm reading a show i'm watching a quote i'm thinking about all with that military or intel vein so for people who like this show i think you'll like the newsletter as well and with that just a quick comment from a recent five-star review on apple podcast it's from s magavin and it says it's like being interviewed by a friend I listen to quite a few podcasts in this genre. Ryan just has a way about him that makes me feel like I'm sitting on the couch with a couple friends listening to their amazing stories. I'm glad to hear that because that's what it feels like for me when I'm interviewing these guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of the weekend or week whenever you're listening to this and uh, stay safe. Stay safe.